Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O God, our strength and redeemer. Amen. Amen. I have a very wise friend who prepares students who are studying to be priests. And this wise friend, in his instructions about preaching, always says the same thing. He says, when you begin to prepare a sermon, leave space at the top of your first page. And before you write anything else, write boldly across the top of it. Your life depends on this. Your life depends on this. Now in the majority of cases, he says, in the majority of cases, you will erase those words. You'll begin with a story or an interesting turn of phrase in the text. But underlying the words that follow will remain an irrepressible sense that what you are saying is worthy of your people's full attention. But sometimes, Sometimes you will leave those words at the top of the page, and you will know when to do it. You will know when the risen Lord is breaking open his gospel afresh, and there is no catchy story, there is no exegetical exposition of the Greek New Testament, there is no joke, there is no personal anecdote, there is nothing that will possibly speak to your people better than the simple, remarkable truth that your life depends on this. And so here I am this morning, with this piece of paper, and across the top I have left written, your life depends on this. Of course this is true of every passage from Scripture. Of course, in some sense, every passage of Scripture brings us this truth, that our life is dependent on what it, cont what it contains. But today, in the Scriptures that we have assigned for the lectionary readings, we have the exceptional blessing of sharing in a great cosmic dialogue. On the one hand, we have the struggle that is the human life. And on the other hand, we have the unfailing response of perfect compassion that flows directly and immediately straight from the heart of Jesus Christ. I like to think that if someone had never read the Bible at all, and they were to ask us what the Bible is about. This, today, is what we might show them. We can hold up this extraordinary exchange between the 51st Psalm and the Gospel of Luke, chapter 15. We might think of these texts today as a sort of call and response. Psalm 51 is our human call, the most desperate, aching cry of a heart that is consumed by sorrow. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your loving kindness. In your great compassion, blot out all my offenses. This is the psalm we sing on Ash Wednesday. It's the psalm we sing on Good Friday. It's a psalm of lament, and desperation, where the ground has fallen out from beneath our feet, and we recognize not only that we are sinners, but that our sin has actually broken something holy. Indeed, the only real consolation in the psalm is the fact that it's being sung at all. Because if we had truly given up, we would not sing, we would not pray. And yet here we have come to the moment of agony, where we recognize that the only singular possible hope of redemption lies in the providence of our God, whose property is always to have mercy. This is our human condition. And I don't say this to sound like a pessimist. In fact, there are times in each of our lives we read the words of Psalm 51 and thank God, thank God for the grace that it is to know 
that whatever pit we might find ourselves at the bottom of, we're not the first ones to be there. We're not the only ones to be there, and God has never forgotten us. I'm always reminded, when I think of this, of a story a Jewish friend of mine used to tell me about a Hasidic tradition where the rabbis always taught that if you study scripture, it will write the words of God on your heart. On your heart. And one day a student asked the rabbi why he always talked about the words of scripture and the words of God being written on the heart instead of within them. And the rabbi replied to him, my son, only God can write something in the heart. But if you study this and you know them and the words are written upon it, when your heart breaks, they will fall inside. We encounter the words of Psalm 51, and sometimes it doesn't seem particularly astonishing. We let them settle on the heart. We move on, there's the rest of the liturgy and the hymns and the beautiful reading from the gospel. But each one of us, whether it's Good Friday or Ash Wednesday or Last Tuesday, each one of us, no matter what sort of life we lead, will someday feel those words crash into the splinters of our hearts as they break. Have mercy on me, O oh God, according to your loving kindness. This is the call of the human condition. This is what we cry out to God in our human condition. But then listen. Listen to God's response, because there is a cry out of the depths of this human pain. And what is the response of God? What is the response of the almighty, invisible, immortal God? Jesus told them this parable. Luke, chapter 15. Jesus is among tax collectors, sinners, and the respectable authorities of the day are beside themselves. Not only is this person who is purporting to be a holy teacher and preacher of the word of God speaking with these degenerate sinners, but he's eating with them. He's showing them kindness. And here Jesus, our beloved Jesus, gives us the heavenly response of that immortal, invisible, only God to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. The response of this God is a shepherd leaving the 99 to seek the one who has wandered away in the wilderness. A woman a woman with nine perfectly lovely and very present coins upturning her entire house to search for the one that has been lost. And if we were to continue the gospel reading this morning, we would just go a bit further and encounter the well-known story of the prodigal son, the younger son who squanders his inheritance and yet repents and is welcomed back by his father with mercy. It is said that Parables are earthly ways of teaching us heavenly truth. And here in these earthly, simple images, Jesus teaches us the heavenly truth about God's relationship with us. God is not distant from us. He is not up in the sky, hidden behind some ancient riddles and laughing at us from some impenetrable palace. He's not waiting for us to solve some impossible algorithm or holding us to a standard of perfect behavior that we might attain in order for him to pay attention to us. God, God is in love with us. God is in love with us and is seeking us out. God aches for us and before anything else, he is goodness itself. And he is longing for us to partake in him. Which one of you, having a hundred sheep and losing one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go out after the one that is lost until he finds it? This is a ridiculous question. Jesus knew this was a ridiculous question. The people who were listening to him knew that it was a ridiculous question because the answer is, you don't. You absolutely do not in any configuration of rational human 
human person logic, leave your perfectly respectable 99 sheep to go after the one punk who's lost in the wilderness. It would be madness. This doesn't make any sense. And yet this is the heavenly truth of God. The divine response to our wandering, impossibly lost human condition is mercy. And do you see what each of the parables has in common? Each of the parables at the end has a similar resolution. Because at the end of the story, what was lost has been found, and the one who does the finding rejoices. The shepherd rejoices. The woman rejoices. The father of the prodigal son rejoices. And they don't just rejoice, but they do so lavishly. They celebrate. They have feasts. They're inviting their neighbors to join the festivities. And you have to imagine that the woman who lost the coin probably spent more than that coin's value just to throw the party. But here is something that shows us the truth about the eternal and unstoppable passion of God. St. Catherine of Siena, in the 14th century, wrote that God is pazzo d'amore in her Italian. Pazzo d'amore, crazy in love, half drunk with love for the world, for creation, for us, his precious people. St. Catherine knew the pain of sin. She knew the pain of Psalm 51, and yet she wrote that even if all the sins that could possibly be committed were gathered together in one person, for God, it would be like a drop of vinegar in the sea. Pazzo d'amore. The love of God, as the hymn tells us, is wider, broader than the measure of the mind. We are like little children who drop an egg on the floor of the kitchen and weep as we expect our mother to be devastated. But our mother knows that eggs break. Our mother knows that floors are clean. And she loves us anyway. What I'm trying to say about these scripture readings today is that our lives depend on this. Perhaps a better way of phrasing it is that our lives are saved by this. God heard our cries of lament. He heard our Psalm 51. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your loving kindness. He heard this lament and he hears this lament still. And for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Not only did God search us out, he came among us to do it. He became a human person. He became a shepherd, a savior who sits at table with sinners and receives every cry of our unspeakable need and has mercy upon us. Can you imagine God, the immortal almighty, loving a creature so much that he needed to feel for himself what it was like to have a human heartbeat? Let yourself be found. Let yourself be led by the one who loves you. You might be a tiny coin or a disobedient sheep, or a child who keeps dropping eggs on the kitchen floor. But the creator of the universe loves you perfectly. Let him. Think of all the things that you no longer wish to be. Grumpy, impatient, late, 
addicted, disgraceful, ungrateful, distracted, whatever it is that you bear, that you find yourself bearing day after day. Take all of those things and give them to Christ. Give him the self that you no longer wish to be. Do this. Truly do this in prayer. Imagine yourself taking stone after stone out of your pocket and laying them gently at the foot of the cross of the Savior who has redeemed you and yearns for you right now. You might need to ask again tomorrow. You might need to ask again in 10 minutes. But Jesus will always take what you offer him. Let yourself be found. And let him love you. In these earthly days of our lives, the call of our human condition might be the lament of Psalm 51. But we can rest in the gospel truth. Gospel. The gospel truth. That God's response to our lament is Jesus Christ himself. It is Jesus who seeks us out. It is Jesus who finds us. And it is Jesus who rejoices in us with the passion of heaven. Amen. Amen.